people make a gigantic circus about silly things like pronouns, right? The or, Vendetta of you about pronouns. Uh, pronouns. Or, or, there's all kinds of things like this. Like, oh, God, I can't possibly be, you know, a decent human being and call you the, li the, the name you'd like to be called because that's an infringement on my human rights. So uh, our concerns over pronouns as uh, frivolous as was discussed. Okay, so Morgan Auger and people on Morgan's side of the debate uh, regularly want to uh, suggest that uh, referring to a transgender, uh, someone like Morgan, using she or her is just being a decent human being, right? And why can't you just be a, a decent human being? Because this is just, a, you know, it's a trivial for you to refuse to do that. Um, I would suggest that it's not a trivial issue, okay? So I've been in this debate now going on uh, two or three years. And from almost day one, it became apparent to me, uh, like abundantly apparent to me, that language was being used as a psychological and political weapon to condition people and to bludgeon them into submission to transgender ideology. Okay? So it is not uh, a mere trifle. Um, so the reason it's important, and let me just say that in terms of a, a, an act of respect, the act of respect that I give to Morgan Auger is that Morgan uh, has adopted the name Morgan, okay? Just like I've adopted the name Jen. So I, out of respect, will agree to use Morgan, okay? That's a respect. I don't use Morgan's male name, right? That, that would be sort of like uh, referring to Muhammad Ali as Cassius. Like, why would you do that? There's no point in doing that. So I show Morgan res respect by doing that. But when Morgan says that I must refer to Morgan as a as a woman, and as a she, and as a her, that's a big ask, okay? That's asking me to um, basically reprogram my brain and surrender physical reality. But it gets even more insidious than that. So, um, uh, for instance, um, Jennifer Bielek, who, who writes for the um, Federalists in the United States, she's described language or compared language to street signs. Okay, so important street signs have to mean the same thing to everybody all the time. If they don't, you're going to get chaos, right? So I would say that language is, is the same thing. Now, um, Jordan Peterson is frequently uh, 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 portrayed as a great hero for common sense against transgender madness. Uh, I don't see Jordan Peterson that way. Jordan Peterson entered this debate um, basically attacking what he called fake pronouns. Okay, zer, z. I'm not saying those goddamn pronouns. I actually don't have a problem with these. Okay, so if we sort of... Uh, um, and, and I should say that Jordan Peterson is more than willing, and we saw this with Theron Meyer. I don't know if you know who Theron Meyer is, but Theron Meyer is a male who identifies as a woman. And um, Jordan Peterson was more than happy, almost gleeful, to refer to Theron Meyer as a she and a her. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, I would hope that if I were a, a student of Dr. Peterson, that he would refer to me as a... Um... Okay, I need people to be very careful here. The reason Theron Meyer is on the screen, as well as Theron Meyer's American counterpart, Blair White, is because Theron Meyer and Blair White are being used as psychological weapons against you. Theron Meyer and Blair White constitute a form of psychological warfare on the population. The request for you to surrender reality and surrender our language is made much more powerful and effective when presented by a master illusionist like Theron Meyer or Blair White and would be much less effective when delivered by somebody such as Morgan Auger or Gabrielle Ludwig or Jessica Yaniv or Daniel Moscato. The vast majority of the transgender population do not look like Theron Meyer or Blair White. So there is a very insidious and powerful reason why they stick Theron Meyer in your view. They don't mention that both Theron Meyer and Blair White have their male genitalia still intact as does 98% of the transgender population. When you are asked questions about whether or not you're willing to surrender reality and surrender our language, 
You need to not think about Theron Meyer. You need to think about Gabrielle Ludwig and Morgan Auger. The vast majority of transgender people don't look like Theron Meyer and have no requirement to look like Theron Meyer. Now, people like uh, Jordan Peterson have been suggesting or hinting that maybe those transgender who want to be recognized as women should look like Theron Meyer. But that is an insult to not only everybody who identifies as transgender, but it's an insult to women in general who don't look like hypersexual porn stars. That is an extraordinarily reductionist and sexist thing to say, because most women don't look like that. Most women don't have any desire to even attempt to look like that. Some women couldn't look like that if they tried desperately, and that's one of the things that Blair White is always putting out there, that you have to try to look the part. Well, most women don't have an urge to try. What a woman is, is very easy to understand. It is determined by your chromosomes. You are either XX or you are XY. That is a very simple thing. Now, most people can be identified for what the sex they are when they're born in the vast majority of cases, and we don't need to go beyond that, saying that you have to look this way, you have to look like the hypersexual porn star to be a woman, is extraordinarily insulting to women. But the main thing for everybody to keep in mind here is that Theron Meyer constitutes a form of psychological warfare on you. That is why Theron Meyer is on the screen, so beware. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, I would hope that if I were a, a student of Dr. Peterson, that he would refer to me as, as, um, as she and wouldn't have a problem with that. Okay, let me and find the out then. Arises, let, me, let me find out. If she were a student of yours, what would you call her? She. You would. Okay. So now you had some arguments about why the category of woman should be expanded to include people like you. Now, obviously, you're doing everything in your power to present yourself to the world in a manner that makes you easily categorizable. Absolutely. And I, I, I guess I, I don't necessarily uh, even think of it that way. You know, I don't think uh, I want to be seen as woman, so I'm going to do all these things to be viewed as woman. Um, I do all these things because I am a woman. Um, I do all these things just because it comes naturally to me. And the end product happens to be uh, a subject that in people's minds is easily registerable. <laughs> Well, that, 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 well, that's also, I would say, that's an act of politeness on your part. You know, so, so one of the things people concluded when I first made my videos is that I wouldn't use he or she to, to uh, refer to, well, say, someone like yourself who mm. wants to be referred to as she. And my attitude about that was never that. And uh, conceded that she could use the, the word woman, but more, uh, Peterson basically slammed his fist on the table in one interview and said, I will not use your damn fake pronouns, right? So there's all these pronouns that have come up. You're playing this radical collectivist left-wing game. You're trying to gain linguistic, you're trying to gain linguistic supremacy in the, in the area of public discourse. You're doing that using compassion as a guise and you're pulling the wool over people's eyes. I use whatever pronoun seems to go along with the persona that they're projecting publicly. So if, you would respect their choice on an individual level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it, with a with a, with a more uh, contentious pronoun, "je" and "je" and that sort of thing, that's a whole different issue. I'm it's not that, doing this. That's that. Mm -hmm. I'm not using the wor words that other people require me to use, especially if they're made up by radical left-wing ideologues. My goal was. I'm not saying those goddamn pronouns. And the reason I'm not saying them is because they're made up by left-wing ideologues. And I don't like left-wing ideology. And I know where corruption of speech leads. And I'm not going there. Try to say the truth. No matter what. Because the alternative is worse. The truth, no matter what, and that is the real problem that you see with being forced into using these made-up pronouns. Yeah, absolutely. It's my language. I'll take responsibility for what I say. I am not saying your words. Okay, so let's just take a minute here to review exactly what it is that Jordan Peterson has said and the implications thereof. But the first thing that we need to do is 
understand who and what Peterson is. Peterson is probably the world's leading preeminent system and corporate establishment apologist. He regards the jackals and hyenas that run the corporate world as our natural top lobster Darwinian leaders. So what you're going to see here is you're going to see Jordan Peterson blaming everything that's wrong with society on radical collectivist leftists. And that's because he has an agenda. And that agenda is to demonize any sort of sense of human compassion whatsoever. And that is what he calls the left. Now be careful here, because I believe that uh, Jordan Peterson will say, no, I have a sense of compassion. And he'll talk about that. But I would say that Jordan Peterson has the same sense of compassion that Ebenezer Scrooge had. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are. I wish I could say they were not. And the treadmill and the poor law, they're still in full vigor, I presume? Both very busy, sir. Oh, from what you said at first, I was afraid that something had happened to stop them in their useful course. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. Those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there. And some would rather die. <sighs> if they would rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Right, that kind of compassion. There is a very good reason why Jordan Peterson was a keynote speaker at the Trilateral Commission. It's because he is their boy. Jordan Peterson will blame all of this stuff on the radical collectivist activists. Meanwhile, it's his corporate buddies in the Royal Bank and TD Bank and the corporate world who have funded the transgender agenda and without whose money they would not have gotten anywhere. And this is going to include, critically, the pharmaceutical establishment who Jordan Peterson, as a psychologist, is a big supporter of. One of his chapters is entitled something to the effect of, why won't you just take your damn pills? So we know who he represents. At the Trilateral Commission were in attendance people who represented Power Corporation and other elite interests in Canada connected to TD Bank and Royal Bank who have been critical in funding SOGI123 and these other programs that have been pushing this nonsense. The Trilateral Commission also included representatives of the pharmaceutical industry such as Yasuchika Hasegawa, chairman of Takeda Pharmaceutical one of the largest manufacturers of puberty blockers in the world. Do you suppose that they are opposed to the transgender agenda and the transitioning of children? Some of the other members of the Trilateral Commission include or have included David Rockefeller, Paul Volcker, Michael Bloomberg, Jean Charest, former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, Michael Chertoff, former Secretary of Homeland Security, Andre Demaray, President and Co-Chief Executive Officer of Power Corporation, of the infamous Demaray family, formerly the wealthiest family in Canada that controls Power Corporation that has been connected to so many influential political figures in Canada, Henry Kissinger, and no less a figure than Jeffrey Epstein, Yes, the very same Jeffrey Epstein associated with underage prostitutes. These all would constitute what Jordan Peterson calls the top lobsters of society, our natural Darwinian leaders. And we should all just clean our rooms and not trouble these men because we might screw up the world if we try to. And if the power was in your hands, assuming you had the competence, which you don't, you wouldn't have done any better, and even if you had, there would have been someone else waiting right behind you to shoot you the first time you actually tried to do anything good. If you go to Peterson's website, he says on there that he worked with Jim Balsilli, former CEO of BlackBerry's Research in Motion, on a report called Resilient People and Resilient Planet. That report was for the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on global sustainability. and. Uh, Here's what he said his job was. 
I'm a clinical psychologist. I have an active clinical practice. I'm a business consultant. I, I, I do executive coaching for mostly for, for senior partners of big law firms. I worked on the UN Secretary General's high panel for sustainability, the report that was delivered in, I believe, 2013, and, and rewrote the underlying narrative to strip out most of the ideological claptrap. So what Peterson is saying there, basically, is that he was in charge of carefully phrasing everything, right? So he was basically a propaganda agent. So people need to ask why a UN panel on sustainability is going to be recruiting a psychologist to rewrite their document and remove it of political claptrap. Peterson is a master manipulator of words, so he has what I would call the ability to say everything to everyone, but yet build trapdoors into everything so he's saying nothing to anyone. That's his great gift. And that's why the UN's Secretary General's high-level panel recruited him to rewrite the document. But pay attention there, because who was he working with there? He says he was working with Jim Basili. Well, who was Basili? Well, Jim Basili uh, founded the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And who was his partner in that project? George Soros. So he is the great defender of the corporate establishment. But Peterson insists on blaming the radical mouthpiece collectivist activists that you see in the street. So the corporations and super rich who are funding the transgender activist movement get to hide behind activists. In fact, they get the best of both worlds because the activists do their dirty work but then they can point to the crazy activists and say, look, those are crazy leftist activists and these are the nut jobs we've been warning you about all along. Now, I happen to believe that what these radical leftists are asking for, all of these outrageous demands, is not what their corporate masters who are funding them want. Um, basically, we have three different positions. We have reality, the way things always were. We have the crazy ask from what Peterson calls the leftist collectivists. And then we have what I believe is what they really want, which is in between those two. So what's going to happen is at some point, the corporate establishment who wants what's in the middle, not the truth, not reality, they want something in the middle, they're going to go after the crazy nut job activists and say, look, at those people are, are crazy nuts. We have a reasonable compromise for you. Okay, so this is an old lawyer's game. Always ask for much more than you want. So I'm a business consultant. I, I, I do executive coaching for mostly for, for senior partners of big law firms. Uh, furthermore, send out a bunch of nut jobs into the street and have them screaming like lunatics for the craziest things. That makes you seem like the great compromising force. And then when somebody like me comes along and says, no, no, what I want is actual truth and reality. I don't want some sort of compromise on truth and reality. They can point to me and say, well, look at that person is so unreasonable. We're the compromise group here. So beware of that. But this deliberate funding and platforming of the craziest elements of the left and then having people like Jordan Peterson point to them and say, look, it's a neo-Marxist postmodern conspiracy against our natural top lobster masters in the corporate establishment. The neo-Marxists have always been evil and bad and now you can see just how crazy they are. One is reminded in this situation of such intelligence projects as Operation Gladio. Those familiar with uh, intelligence history will know that Operation uh, Gladio had as one of its strategies um, basically setting up people who posed as members of the left and then had them behave really, really badly so that they could point to them and say, look, we told you that these people on the left were bad. Now look how terrible they are. I think we should spend just a few minutes watching a brief clip from a documentary that explains something known as Operation Gladio. And you should consider exactly what the implications are, or possible implications, for what is going on today. The reason I want people to watch this brief clip from this documentary is because 
most people are incapable of imagining the possibility that their government could engage in mass mind manipulations against their own population. Most people just could not fathom the idea that their government would resort to staging events and having what essentially constitutes intelligence actors operating on the political landscape in order to manipulate the minds of the masses. So I want you to pay very close attention to what you're about to watch. For 40 years, secret terrorist organizations, many trained by Western intelligence agencies, have manipulated the political control of European sovereign states by a campaign of terror and murder. Originally part of a secret network, these groups changed from being defenders of state security into attackers of the established political order. Until two years ago, that secret network was generally known by the single word, Gladio. Operation Gladio was a secret, highly classified operation that was initiated by Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Churchill intended to set up a secret European-wide cell of military units that would basically be able to mobilize in response to a potential invasion of Western Europe by uh, communist Russia. Now, these cells were actually set up with the uh, support of the United States. NATO was the main vehicle. It was done secretly across most, uh, many Western European countries. And over time, it evolved into a highly kind of disturbing form of covert action. And Operation Gladio was um, actually a specific operation as part of this overall process, which was taking place in Italy. In the end, we had a situation where these actual cells were given the task of actually carrying out various kind of actions, including terrorist activity in different parts of Western Europe, in order to project blame onto left-wing social movements. With no Soviet army to repel, the fascists increasingly focused on what they regarded as the enemy within. False flag terror would be their primary weapon. Operation Gladio and related programs in other European nations were kept secret for decades, but eventually revealed in a series of judicial and congressional investigations in the early 1990s. In Italy, the program was closely linked to a Masonic League known as P2, or Propaganda Due. It was made up of military and intelligence officers, political leaders, industrialists, mafioso, bankers. Among its current members is recent Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. During his tenure as Prime Minister, Berlusconi openly expressed admiration for Mussolini and the philosophy of fascism. A 1969 memo from a Ginter Press, a fascist front group, is explicit about Gladio's tactics. Acts of terrorism will seem to have emanated from our adversaries, and pressure brought to bear on people in whom power is invested at every level. That will create a feeling of hostility. At the same time, we must rise up as defender of the citizenry against the disintegration brought about by terrorism and subversion. Okay, let me just pause this for a second. So, after creating chaos, they suggest that they must rise up and present themselves as the defenders of the people from the chaos that they have created. Okay, so let's turn that around and take a look at the transgender debate. Here we have the corporate complex funding transgender activism, funding all of these programs that are causing all of this chaos, and now the representatives of the establishment in the corporate complex, people such as Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Kay, are rising up and saying, we are here to defend you against the craziness. The craziness that their masters 
and those that they defend so vigorously have caused. Even more explicit was Gladio participant Vincenzo Vincenguera, who went on the record for the BBC, stating outright the shocking mission and targets of Gladio. It was called the Strategy of Tension. You were supposed to attack civilians, women, children. Innocent people outside the political arena for one simple reason. To force the Italian public to turn to the state. Turn to the regime and ask for greater security. It did seem to be the case that for the most part, civilian governments were not aware of the nature of these operations going on and were completely shocked when they discovered that um, you had CIA and MI6 through NATO effectively infiltrating their own intelligence services and, and, and operating autonomous subsections of these agencies in order to carry out these kind of operations. I want to just interject something quickly here. And that has to do with the fact that it was suggested at one point by people in Chicago that Morgan Auger was actually a Central Intelligence Agency agent, and that his job was to cause as much fuss as possible in this debate. Now, we have asked Morgan Auger on multiple occasions if he has ever signed a national security agreement either in the United States or Canada, and in every instance, O.J. has refused to answer the question. The strategy of tension was a Europe-wide enterprise. The first stage was to make attacks which would be blamed on the left. The second stage was actual infiltration of groups on the left. In some of these cases, you had situations where you had local left-wing groups who had emerged organically on the basis of perfectly normal domestic kind of dynamics and were infiltrated and, and manipulated by, by intelligence agencies to, to instigate these acts of propagation and to take the blame. So that's an, that gives you an example where organic forms of political movements can be infiltrated, manipulated, mobilised by states to carry out this kind of activity. And it did create a massive kind of drive against left-wing movements to encroach on civil liberties. What we learned from Operation Gladio is that intelligence and covert action as carried out by states is clearly something which is routinely conducted under the radar. And to be honest with you, I think this is not really something controversial. I mean, anyone who has genuinely studied covert operations and the, the, the nature and structure of intelligence agencies will be aware that the whole point of covert action is precisely to conceal it from public awareness. The danger of it is, is clearly that when you have a case like Operation Gladio or the strategy of tension, this really reveals how far intelligence agencies are able to go as a consequence of that. And that raises a lot of disturbing questions about really the scope of the intelligence agencies and their capacity to, to conduct very, very dangerous covert action, which is not in the interests of the wider public, which is not in the national interest, and which violates even the basic kind of rule of law that is established by the civilian government. Now, the person that has just been talking is Nafiz Ahmed. I'm stopping here just to point out that what you're about to see, and what you'll see later in this video, is the injection into the transgender debate of somebody named Jonathan Kay. Jonathan Kay is a corporate apologist and a creation of Conrad Black and the corporate establishment. And he has made it his job to expose anybody who questions the establishment as conspiracy theorists. And he has called Ahmed such a conspiracy theorist. In order to sidestep the issue and deep politics as a whole, many journalists and academics have created a workaround. They call it conspiracy theory. How much would you attribute the increase in conspiratorial thinking to that red line? Jonathan Kay is on the right here and is busy talking about how conspiracy theorists are undermining trusting government, or what I prefer to call the establishment. 
whom government serves. Kay and his mother Barbara are both writers for the National Post and pretend to be unbiased journalists and voices of compromise. Well, conspiracy mongering. Fringe conspiracy theorists. Conspiracy theorists. Conspiracy theorists. Those true believers in the mystic power of New Age crystals, spirit channeling of people who talk to trees. You know, the term conspiracy theory is a very interesting one. Uh, it is, of course, applied to almost anything that's perceived as threatening, any kind of broader attempt to explain specific events. There are actual people, actual covert operations, actual things happening that we don't know about, and it's very, very important to understand them. I mean, they are fundamentally conspiracies, which simply means uh, uh, several people colluding in a secret and uh, illegal operation. Conspiracies are prosecuted every day in the courtrooms of this country, uh, and theory is what we use to try to understand things. So uh, I find the term conspiracy theory a broad brush pejorative, which I think is designed to suppress discussion. So when you're trying to determine who's been driving all of this insanity, I want you to think for a moment about who has been funding this insanity. Furthermore, if you want to understand who is driving this, take a look at what has happened to me. Who is it that has censored me and shut me down over and over again? It has been the entire establishment, okay? It has been government. It has been the two largest newspaper chains in British Columbia, Black Press, and Post Media. Again, National Post, Jonathan Kay, Jordan Peterson, all of these people. They shut me down. They claim to be the champions of free speech and free inquiry. And yet uh, the uh, Post Media wouldn't allow me to advertise my events. Okay, it has been the establishment that has shut me down. I mean, yes, the crazy activists came out to my protests and stuff, but they have very little power except for on the ground like that. They don't have the power to stop me from advertising. They don't have the power to stop me from renting public venues. That's the establishment. Furthermore, the so-called champions of free speech, such as Jonathan Kay and Barbara Kay and Jordan Peterson, none of them have given me even a single shred of official support. So when you're trying to determine who's been driving all of this insanity, I want you to think for a moment about who has been funding this insanity. It's been people like, uh, uh, not only as I've already mentioned, the TD Bank and Royal Bank, but figures such as Jennifer Pritzker. Who is Jennifer Pritzker? Well, Jennifer Pritzker is this uh, transgender identified person, uh, but who is a hardcore Republican Party supporter not some radical leftist uh, collectivist. Then there's somebody like Mark Burnett, the producer of the television series Survivor, uh, which engaged in, as I illustrated in, an, in another podcast, uh, a massive brainwashing operation, basically, to make it clear that nobody should be questioning the transgender agenda. Well, who is Mark uh, Burnett? Some sort of radical leftist collectivist? No, Mark Burnett is the man who more than anybody built and put, helped put into power Donald Trump. Look at some of the uh, leading transgender voices out there. Uh, one that we're talking about here, which is Theron Meyer and uh, Blair White. Both of these figures are conservatives. Theron Meyer was even the president of the Men's Rights Club at Simon Fraser University, uh, where uh, we both actually went to, to school. So hardly radical left-wing collectivist activists. Okay, so let's pay very close attention to who Jordan Peterson is identifying as the enemy. Is it transgender ideology or is it something else? You're playing this radical collectivist left-wing game. Especially if they're made up by radical left-wing ideologues. And the reason I'm not saying them is because they're made up by left-wing ideologues. Okay, so here we have Jordan Peterson blaming everything on this radical collectivist left-wing politics. But that's just because Jordan Peterson needs to blame everything that is wrong with society on what he calls leftists. But the thing is, is that all of this transgender nonsense is not leftist. It is something unique unto itself. Uh, traditional leftist ideology was more focused on class consciousness, 
okay? So uh, the fact that, for instance, in our society, uh, the average person keeps getting poorer and poorer and poorer, while the super rich keep getting richer and richer and richer. So leftist ideology would address something like that as being critically important, and all this transgender stuff would be considered uh, uh, incidental at best. But uh, Peterson can't have you thinking that. Peterson has to have you thinking that if you are opposed to the top lobster, super wealthy, super rich, that that means that you're a crazy nut job who denies physical reality. The thing is, is that I am actually on the left, but in sort of this class sense, in the sense that I believe that we have a corporate wealthy elite that have run amok and who are draining the lifeblood out of the average person in society. But I don't support any of this radical trampling of women's rights in reality. What Jordan Peterson wants you to do is he wants you to blame these guys instead of blaming these guys, the guys who really have the power. Peterson actually is okay with surrendering reality, so he's willing to recognize that uh, a man, if that man is sexy enough, can be called and referred to as a woman and treated as a woman. I don't. I believe that physical reality is absolute. So be very careful when you're listening to Jordan Peterson and what he appears to represent. Now let's take a closer look at exactly what he's saying and some of the failures in what he is saying. You're playing this radical collectivist left-wing game. You're trying to gain linguistic. You're trying to gain linguistic supremacy in the in the area of public discourse. You're doing that using compassion as a guise, and you're pulling the wool over people's eyes. So here I'm actually going to argue that it's Peterson who is pulling the wool over people's eyes, because what he is doing here is he is essentially taking what he calls fake pronouns off the table and forcing people to use either she or he. So if, you would respect their choice on an individual level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it, with a with a, with a more uh, contentious pronouns, "je" and "je" and that sort of thing, that's a whole different issue. I'm You've not thought, doing this. That's that. Mm -hmm. I'm not using the wor words that other people require me to use. Oh my, Jordan, those are such strong, manly words. Let's just see if you can live up to such manly words. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, I would hope that if I were a, a student of Dr. Peterson, that he would refer to me as, as, um, as she and wouldn't have a problem with that. If she but were a student of yours, what would you call her? She. You would. Okay. I'm not using the wor words that other people require me to use. Seems to be a bit of a contradiction there, Jordan. I thought you weren't going to use the words other people required you to use. And yet Theron just bats his pretty eyes and you just collapse like a house of cards. I'm not using the wor words that other people require me to use, especially if they're made up by radical left-wing ideologues. I'm not saying those goddamn pronouns. And the reason I'm not saying them is because they're made up by left-wing ideologues. And I know where corruption of speech leads. And I'm not going there. We know where corruption of speech leads without Jordan Peterson telling us, because anything that disagrees with Peterson's worldview leads inevitably to the gulags. It's like, what, do you think a person can believe something is true and false at the same time? Do you honestly believe that? That's bloody postmodern neo-Marxism, man. And if you ever want to rescue your father from the belly of the well, you had bloody well stop speaking mistruths you know to be mistruths. I just work here? Oh, you just work here, huh? Well, we're all gonna be just working at a bloody gulag if you don't clean your room. But the truth is, it is not left-wing ideologues who are pushing this agenda. It is the establishment. And I know where corruption of speech leads. And I'm not going there. But you are going there, Jordan. You have already gone there. You have already conceded that you will call somebody that you know is a male, a she or a her or a woman, 
as long as they look sexy enough. In fact, you are corrupting our language far worse than even the most radical far-left extremists ever could. If we accept what you are proposing, we will no longer be able to determine whether we are talking about a male or a female in a sentence. I can imagine no more of a chaotic and corrupting violation of our language than that. And that is what you promote. Z and Zer is nothing compared to that. So, for instance, let's just take the following sentence. My cousin went down to the corner store and bought some groceries for me. She paid the clerk, then came back home, gave me the groceries, and I told her how thankful I was for her assistance. Now, if we follow your suggestion here, we will no longer know if we're talking about a male or a female. Whereas if we accepted Z and Zer in that sentence, we would actually increase clarity, and we would know exactly what we're talking about. Whereas under your proposal, her, who knows what that's referring to? Could be a man, could be a woman, could be somebody who's transgender. We have no idea. So you are the great corrupter of language. And this stubborn refusal to accept new pronouns is insane. And actually helps to serve the uh, official agenda, which I believe is looking to control and manipulate language and reality. And turn over interpretation of these things to the state and the establishment that you represent. As I've said, I cannot imagine a greater assault or corruption of our language than that. I cannot imagine anything more confusing and corrupting than what you are suggesting. And we know what corruption of speech and not telling the truth leads to, don't we, Jordan? Look at yourself before you end up with a dirty room and get us all sent off to the gulag! So let's do a little thought experiment here. Okay, so you've got somebody like uh, Morgaine or Theron Meyer who say that referring to them using he is offensive. Okay, so what do I do? I say, well, let's come up with uh, some new pronouns or use some of these new pronouns that other people have made up like she and sir. But then Jordan Peterson comes along and says, no, 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 I refuse to use those damn fake pronouns. We're not gonna use those, okay? So we take the fake pronouns off the table and we are left again with just she or he. You can either be truthful and say he, but then in comes Jonathan Kay, who's gonna say, no, you're not allowed to do that because that just means you're impolite and nasty. So that forces us back into using she and surrendering language and erasing women from our language. That is not an acceptable solution. Okay, so Jordan Peterson is willing to surrender she and her, but he will not surrender she and zer. Well, that is exactly what Morgan Auger wants. Morgan Auger doesn't want to be referred to as she and zer. Morgan wants people to trample reality, to turn reality on its head, and be referred to as she and her and a woman. And Jordan Peterson is willing to grant that to Auger. You will note in this tweet that uh, Peterson sent out regarding Auger that Peterson is very careful. He's always very careful with his words. Peterson does not say at any point that O.J. is a man what would you call her? She. or he or a him. Peterson assiduously avoids that. And that's because Jordan Peterson is not the champion of truth that he claims to be. Jordan Peterson is more than happy to refer to men as she and her and as a woman. Now it's interesting to note that Jordan Peterson at last check was working on some sort of uh, secret project uh, in the office of the National Post. Now the National Post, of course, is connected to Barbara Kay uh, and her son, Jonathan Kay, who was one of the original editors for the National Post. Uh, Jonathan Kay is one of the uh, apologists out there for surrendering the language to people like uh, Morgan Auger, as we're going to see shortly here. And it's interesting to note that uh, Morgan Auger said to one of my supporters 
that rather than supporting me, they should consider supporting somebody like Barbara Kay at the National Post. So the National Post gang is actually Morgan Auger's preferred opposition. And when you look at the fact that uh, Peterson and Auger seem to be on the same page with the she and her pronouns, one has to wonder about that. That is why I say Jordan Peterson is not part of the solution. He is part of the problem. And that should not be a surprise because I have said for some time that the transgender agenda is not a left versus the right debate. The transgender agenda is coming from the establishment. It is a top-down agenda. And Jordan Peterson is probably the leading establishment apologist in the world. Try to say the truth. No. Try not. Do. Or do not. There is no try. If she were a student of yours, what would you call her? She. You would. Okay. Try to say the truth. No matter what. Because the alternative is worse. Say the truth no matter what. And this is what Jordan Peterson says. The truth is that Theron Meyer is a male and should be referred to as he and him. The truth is that Theron Meyer, just like Blair White, has male genitalia. Just because you can't see that genitalia doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But its very existence proves what the truth is. A magician may appear to saw a woman in half on the stage, but that doesn't make it true. A champion of truth would speak the truth, which is not something that you are, Jordan. You are a champion of confusion, confusing our language, and a champion of deception. You are championing the idea that illusion is reality, that maya is reality. When philosophers and mystics since the dawn of time have all understood that maya is not reality. You are a pretty poor philosopher, Jordan Peterson, and you are a weakling. Maybe try standing up for the truth. Do you think a trans woman is a real woman? Try to say the truth, no matter what. Do or do not. There is no try. Do you think a trans woman is a real woman? Here is your chance, Jordan. Say the truth. <laughs> I don't really like the way those questions are formulated. You know, I don't know what that means. What do you mean a real woman? Now, is it true, Jordan, that you don't know what she means when she asks if a trans woman is a real woman? That is why you fail. If you're born a man and you wish to be treated as a woman, what are the minimal obligations that you have to undertake in order to be granted that, let's say, privilege? To be regarded as the gender that you identify as commonsensically within your culture. To yeah, well, okay. Well, that seems to be at least reasonable. If she were a student of yours, what would you call her? She. You would. Okay. Try to say the truth, no matter what. The truth is that Meyer is a male. That means Meyer should be referred to as a man. And the pronouns associated with a man are he and him. When you refer to a man using she and her, this is essentially a lie. You are misidentifying them. And once again, corrupting our language. So if you want to always speak the truth, now is your chance to be strong and brave. Now I have said, and I have conceded, that if referring to Meyer as a he and a him is just too offensive, okay, the compromise is to use what you call fake pronouns, but which are in fact a reasonable compromise that does no violence to our language and does not erase women from our language. It's my language. I'll take responsibility for what I say. I am not saying your words. But the problem is, is that if we uh, uh, accept what um, Jordan is, is uh, saying there, uh, then all we have on the table is she 
and heat. Okay, and uh, that's a problem. Okay, so if the word she does not, as a pronoun, does not refer to a female, then what pronoun does? Okay, there is no pronoun then. So the transgender activist movement likes to say that people are trying to erase their existence. I would say it's the other way around. Because they are seizing the language that used to uh, like solely identify females, they are erasing biological women from our language. And this is a serious issue. Um, it's also kind of a, a, like a, what I call a neuro-linguistic game that they're playing because um, what happens is that when you refer to a male using uh, female identifiers like she and stuff, you're opening up areas of the brain previously reserved exclusively for females, right? It's kind of like the neurological equivalent of opening up women's changes, change rooms to men, right? So it's a, kind of like a, almost a deep magic thing, like deep psychology that's going on. So I, I resist that as well. But George Orwell um, talked about the fact that, uh, and I'm spending a little time on this because this is important, right? So George Orwell talked about the, the fact that uh, if, you, if you look at decaying sci uh, societies, one of the things you'll see is a decay in the language. Because language naturally expands to include new things. So, you know, 20 years ago, texting was a nonsense word. So um, Jordan Peterson and some of his followers say, well, zer is a nonsense word. Well, half of our language was a nonsense word at some time. As new things are introduced, we create new words to identify them and clarify them. If we get into a situation where a language starts contracting and becoming less clear, that's a bad thing. And that's what we see happening in, in this particular um, instance, back to Orwell again, he uh, uh, suggested that um, if you could, in a society, get enough control of language and manipulate language enough, you could actually uh, maneuver society into a state where people would not be able to describe their own oppression. Okay? And uh, the best example I have of this is a uh, radio interview I did with Carleen Nation in uh, Toronto, in Mississauga, I think it was. Uh, she's a former CBC reporter, and uh, I was on her radio show, and uh, we were talking about the Jessica Yanov case, right? And I was trying to explain in the course of that interview why this was such an outrage. And I said, well, here you've got a group of women who provide women-only services, intimate women-only services, relaxing and stuff. And Jessica Yanov comes along, who's male, and he's basically trying to use the law to force these women to provide uh, waxing services around his genitals. At that point in the interview, Carlene stopped me and said, no, 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 it's her. Okay, I, I identify Yanov as a woman and as a her and as a she. Okay, so if I agree at that point, okay, and if I say, okay, um, I know that uh, Yanov is male, but you say I have to use the uh, uh, she and her and stuff, rework that sentence. Okay, so... Um, trying to force these women to perform waxing around, not his, but her genitals. You've just taken away the ability to describe the outrage that is happening. See, and that's what, uh, the, what uh, Orwell talked about. We saw uh, some of the, the stuff that's going on in terms of pronouns at uh, the Megan Murphy event that you went to at the Crystal Pavilion at the uh, Pan Pacific or whatever that is. Uh, when Jonathan Kay um, responded to Morgan Auger, uh, and I think you were sitting next to Morgan. You weren't there on a date, were you? No, no okay. <laughs> right. So um, Morgan Auger got up and spoke, and Jonathan Kay started off by saluting, saying, "I salute you, Morgan Auger." Which I was like, okay, "Here's this person who's been trampling women's rights left, right, and center, and engaging in all of these outrages, and he's in a room full of <laughs> women who are not fans of that type of thing, and and he's uh, saluting Morgan." But we'll put that aside. But then he started surrendering the language to Morgan, saying. Um, you know, she and her, and got into like a debate with, uh, well, this is an act of respect, exactly what uh, Morgan is talking about. Okay, I want to just spend a minute doing a little setup for this clip of Jonathan Kay from the talk he did with Megan Murphy at the Crystal Pavilion in Vancouver. I want to ask you to pay very close attention to how Jonathan Kay, who I call a system apologist, that was one of the original editors for the National Post and has taken part in proclaiming those who undermine trust in government as conspiracy theorists. So pay very close attention to how Jonathan Kay is trying to reinforce and return faith in the institutions of power 
that have failed us in this transgender debate over and over again. And do note that there has been a call put out by the leaders of society for the press to help restore faith in the system. We live in a time when people are losing trust in their institutions. It is the job of every single person in this room, members of the press, to uphold and renew that trust. And then also pay attention how he refers to the women in the room who want to use language in a way that reflects reality. He refers to them not as being merely impolite. He refers to them as being gratuitously impolite. So in the interest of creating dialogue, I would like to salute you, uh, Morgane. Another origin story is that men in armor would raise the visors of their helmets to greet their lords or commanders. I would like to salute you, uh, Morgane. Uh, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for asking your question. You asked it in a spirit of request, in, of respect. Um, so, Morgane, I, I disagree with much of you, what you put on Twitter, but the job, Morgane is an activist. The job of any activist is to state her cause in a maximalist way. Wait, wait, wait a sec. All activists do this. It is the job of other people in society, editors, lawmakers, judges, human tribunal uh, adjudicants, it is their job to balance the claims made by different activists in a sensible and humane and non-dogmatic way. It is the job of other people in society, editors. It's the job of editors, Jonathan? Why, why that's you, Jonathan. Oh, you're going to find truth and balance for us, are you, Jonathan? Wow, I'm glad to hear that. I feel so much better that we can rely on people like you and on our court system that, for instance, ruled that a father couldn't refer to his daughter as a daughter anymore. We should just have faith in our system and editors like you, shouldn't we, Jonathan? Lawmakers, judges, human tribunal uh, adjudicants, it is their job to balance the claims made by different activists in a sensible and humane and non-dogmatic way. The people who are activists and who state their cause in a maximalist way, Morgana's doing her job. I just, her job. It doesn't do you any good to be gratuitously impolite. You're trying to gain linguistic supremacy in the, in the area of public discourse. You're doing that using compassion as a guise and you're pulling the wool over people's eyes. Her job. It doesn't do you any good to be gratuitously impolite. I've admitted that. But if you want to create dialogue, if you want people to take you seriously, be polite, be respectful. You should also note that Megan Murphy does not have anything to say about Kay's surrender of language or his shaming of women. Now, it is unfortunate that I was not there, because had I been there, Jonathan Kay would not have gotten away with his assault on language nor his shaming of women. I would have been all over him in a second. This is why I have said for some time that although I support much of what Megan has done, she is weak on language and quite clearly fits in with the corporate big pharma friendly fallback position that the National Post gang and the Toronto Cabal are pushing and trying to use to prove that they are the heroes of common sense. Well, what they are offering is just a watered down version of the same nonsense that the transgender activists have been pushing for so long. Jonathan Kay in the National Post went on and on about the alleged censorship of Megan Murphy. When Megan Murphy has not undergone anything resembling the censorship that I have experienced, Megan Murphy has actually not had a talk cancelled by the administration of any public facility. I have, repeatedly. I've had five colleges and universities either cancel my talks or refuse to host my talks. I've had three cities say that they will not rent public facilities to me. None of this has happened to Megan Murphy, and yet complete silence from the National Post gang and from the Post Millennial gang, despite the fact that I know Jonathan Kay is aware of what has happened to me. They had nothing to say about me uh, in the wake of UBC being kicked out of the Vancouver Pride Parade. The reason they are promoting Megan Murphy is because Megan Murphy does not threaten the establishment agenda. Megan Murphy does not threaten their 
role as heroes of truth and sanity. Megan Murphy does not criticize the pharmaceutical complex that is driving this. Megan Murphy does not criticize SOGI 123 and the brainwashing of our children in schools. That's why they are promoting Megan Murphy and remaining completely silent about the much more serious and effective censorship of me. They are fake champions of free speech and are full participants in the assault on language and the continued trampling of reality and the assault on our most vulnerable children that I've been trying desperately to get the National Post and other publications to pay attention to. But they ignore this because they don't want the public getting this information and realizing that they are part of the agenda and not really opposed to it at all. She came into a, she came in to a hostile room, stood up and asked a question. Um, and then some of the women in the room sort of spoke up and went, it's a he, it's a him, it's a his, and, and they were quite, quite angry. And Jonathan Kay tried to use social shaming to get them into line, saying, well, you need to just be respectful. You know, you're not going to get anywhere by being disrespectful. But that's, again, this is that social shaming thing where they're trying to force people into surrendering language that I think I've been able to illustrate here is more than just a trifle. It's important. Language helps us organize and understand uh, our world. And uh, we have specific pronouns for females, and those need to stay in place. And that's why I'm a stickler for uh, correct use of pronouns.